Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today on our COVID-19 workplace safety focus on gyms and fitness centers and uh, getting open and staying open. During the presentation today, you'll see a question and answer box that you can click and submit questions as we go through. Uh, normally, we try to keep this to about a half an hour, and I'll try to keep my remarks short, but because gyms are just getting back and fitness centers are just getting back to that reopening phase, I'll probably spend a little bit more time in the details. So if we don't get to your questions, we do intend to continue these types of Q&A sessions, and we will try to do our best to make sure that we either answer them after the fact or we include them in our next uh, presentation. So I can tell you that here in the Department of Labor and Economic Opportunity uh, and myself, Sean Egan, as the Director of COVID Workplace Safety, we've been working very hard to support the local businesses and workers out there as we get open and stay open. And that's really our focus is to try to keep things open in a way that's safe for workers and for the uh, communities that we serve. So uh, as we move through this process, keep that in mind that that's really what we're trying to focus on and do. So one of the things that we have to do or we need to do is just always keep in mind how this virus spreads and what's happening with COVID. Because in Michigan, we know that early in the year, we saw our numbers spike really high. The governor put in some very strict protocols and our numbers came down and we've been having these bumps along the way. So COVID primarily spreads through large respiratory droplets or aerosols that we exhale from our body when we talk, breathe, sneeze, cough, et cetera. And these can travel for some distance. And about 40% or so of this transmission is believed to come from those that are asymptomatic, meaning that they have the virus, but they'll never get sick. Or another significant percentage from those that are pre-symptomatic, meaning that they feel fine. Which is why it's so important that we really encourage those things that have stayed static throughout this crisis, even though we've seen a lot of news and otherwise, uh, these few techniques have really remained the same throughout the crisis, and that's the need to practice social distancing of six feet or more, wear face coverings when we cannot do that or when we're indoors, and practice good hygiene because as we're expelling those droplets, they land on surfaces around us, and we can contaminate ourselves by touching our eyes, nose, or mouth. And the facial coverings really help cut down the distance that the virus can spread from our bodies. And when we think of places like gyms and fitness centers and how we exhale this virus from our bodies when we're exerting ourselves in a higher capacity. So if you were shouting or singing, it would be similar. We can actually create more of that aerosol, more of those droplets and push it further away from us because we're working that much harder and exerting ourselves that much more. So if we think about what these masks can do and face coverings and why we wear them, that as you can see, when we had the stay home, stay safe order, there was practically no risk of transmission between us because we were in the ultimate form of social distancing and always away from each other. And then our lowest chance of transmission between each other are when we are wearing face coverings and maintaining that six feet of social distance. And then we still remain low and we're both wearing face coverings. Certainly the chance of transmission goes up from there. Now it's believed that the face coverings cut the risk of transmission by about 70%. But as I mentioned in gyms and fitness centers, we really have to think a little bit further because we are exhaling at much greater force, which can push this virus much further away from us. So as we move towards getting gyms and fitness centers reopened, getting them open and staying open so that we can all get back to our routines, uh, we, we've created a lot of guidance that you're all becoming quite familiar with. And I'm sure that most of you spent most of the last several days and a lot of hours looking through those guidelines and trying to get your place ready for being back in there. Or if you are going to go exercise, getting yourself ready for what to expect when you go back in there. There are a lot of specific guidelines. So I'm gonna mention a website in just a couple of minutes where you can find all of this information uh, that you need, but posted are general industry guidelines that apply across every industry. And then executive orders have specific requirements for certain industries. When you see the guidelines for gyms, fitness centers, bowling alleys, ice rinks, et cetera, it'll include all of those gener general industry guidelines as well as those ones specific for you. And here are some of those for gyms and fitness centers specifically that you need to be following. That includes limiting the capacity in your facility to 25% of the total occupancy limits. That's that little sign on the wall that the fire marshal or local fire uh, inspector puts in there that says how many people you can have in there. Even when you do that though, you need to think about your space 
because you also need to maintain that six feet of social distance from one another. And there's a difference between a class where you have a signed up group of people that are gonna come from different households and work together. They still have to comply with the 10 person limit that's included in executive order 176. For those reservations or other things you're doing, you, it's the 25% of your total occupancy while you're still maintaining that six feet of social distance. You have to mandate wearing facial coverings at all times except when folks are swimming. Now, facial coverings mean those cloth face coverings or surgical masks that fit tight around your face, cover your nose and mouth and under, under your chin. We've gotten some questions about the plastic alternatives and those do not meet the, re the requirement of this executive order because the what we're trying to cut down on is how far and where that virus can go if somebody has it and they're expelling it and the cloth face coverings and surgical masks because they're tighter fitting to your face pull that right down and keep that close to you those plastic masks which we understand may need may, may be necessary for some in some workplaces because of an accommodation may not actually cut down how far that goes and i should note that the cdc has also said they do not uh, they are not supportive of those face coverings that have those valves in them. Some of the face coverings with those valves don't actually stop the virus from moving away from you. And the University of Duke actually put out some guidance and a study on the gaiters, which are the ones that wrap around your neck and you pull up over your face when you need them. And those might not be providing much protection as well. So check those out and make sure that the masks that you're requiring are those cloth face coverings or surgical masks that will help trap that virus from moving away from people if they have it. Uh, certainly, this hasn't been a big change, but regularly disinfect your exercise equipment immediately after use, of course. And if you're going to expect the folks doing the workouts to do that, make sure that you have signs uh, to use and disinfect that equipment. Ensure your ventil ventilation systems are systems are out part we have a very low risk of transmission especially if we're wearing those facial coverings and part of the reason for that is because of all the outdoor air sort of like cough, pouring a cup of coffee into Lake Michigan that it's going to disperse very quickly and there's a lot of paths for it to disperse when we get indoors then we have less dispersion and we can actually still have masses of the virus that could create a, a, a possible contaminating uh, enough uh, uh, to infect somebody that we really need to pay attention to. And we also want to keep in mind that the executive order still strongly encourages you to use outdoor fitness training if you can do that. So, you know, focus on that one while, this, while the weather holds up. And then if you're going indoors, you need to really follow these limits. Make sure your ventilation's working well. Get that fresh air coming in more frequently so that you can help disperse any concentration of the virus. You need to close those steam rooms, saunas, jacuzzis, and uh, the uh, cool down pools uh, to make sure that we're not having congregation, there's higher humidity, and there's some other issues there that you really need to pay attention to. You will have to absolutely maintain accurate records, including the date and time that somebody comes in and leaves, the name of who it is and contact information, and you must deny entry to anybody that's coming in that will not give you their name and phone number. And this is critical for the contact tracing that public health will do if there happens to be an outbreak in your facility. And then to the extent that's feasible, configure your workout stations and implement protocols to enable six feet of distance between individuals. And as I mentioned at the outset, when we think about what's been static in this virus, uh, that social distancing, face coverings, good hygiene. So these rules are really built around these concepts and then the ability to contact trace if there happens to be an outbreak in your workplace. If you go to our great website, michigan.gov, COVID workplace safety, we have these guidelines, the uh, fact sheets, uh, and other information that you can use in your workplace. Everything, these are MIOSHA created guidelines based on the CDC guidelines and executive orders. These are great tools and we'll explain to you the things that you need and must be doing in your workplace. They apply to employees as well as uh, some of the, the requirements that are applied to customers coming in and otherwise. We have posters there and we're updating those for gyms and fitness centers and bowling alleys and others, so please check back often. Uh, we have some videos there and we'll be updating those for gyms as well. 
Uh, every industry that's been named in an executive order has guidelines here. So these are a few of the examples of the posters that you'll need to have. You're, keep in mind that you, if you are open to the public, you do need to require everybody coming in to wear that face covering, including when they're working out now, as we know for gyms and fitness centers, except when they're swimming, of course. Uh, and you should have these signs posted. And we'll, like I mentioned, we're gonna be creating more for gyms specifically, so check back often. If you have questions, the Myosha team developed a hotline several months ago 855-SAFE-C19 that goes directly into my OSHA. You'll talk with the experts there about things that you need to be doing. And this is for either employers or employees with questions about COVID, the executive orders and otherwise. The wait time is about 15 to 25 seconds just to get through the phone tree primarily. The average call time is about four to five minutes depending on your issue. If, you, if it's necessary and you're an employer, they will get you over to the consultation team who will help you even further. If you're an employee, they can get you over to the complaint side if that's necessary. But this is a great resource. I would encourage you all to use it. Ask those questions. Make sure that you're getting the right guidance right from the Myosha experts. We've also launched recently an ambassador program. This is a consultation program, not an enforcement program with uh, ambassadors, as we call them, consultants that are going to go out into the local communities, stop in those businesses that we call a heightened transmission, community transmission risk. Those are open to the public, things like gyms, fitness, retail, bars, restaurants, and just offer a consultation. If you have time, I would encourage you to take advantage of this resource. They are not there to issue citations or penalties. They will just work with you to make sure that you have the tools in place to uh, make your your place of business as safe as possible. And we also have links over to some other great information there. The Michigan Economic Development Corporation has a Peer Michigan Business Connect platform where you can find PPE, hand sanitizer, those plastic barriers from Michigan manufacturers if you need those things. Uh, the My Symptoms app, one of the requirements for an employer is you must be conducting a health screening questionnaire every day for employees coming into the workplace. And you can use this app to satisfy that requirement. What you do as an employer is you sign up for the app with your employer name, who you want contacted, all that kind of stuff. You will get an employer specific code that you give to your employees. Then they can use their smartphone, tablet, desktop, whatever device they may have to complete the questionnaire. The employer will get a report of who's taken the screening and what the results were. If an employee flags for symptoms of COVID, they will get an orange screen that says, do not go in, call your supervisor and your healthcare provider. Otherwise, they'll get a green screen that says you're good to go. Definitely check the Michigan Safe Start site for information on what can be open and where and some of the data that we're working with. And then check out the Mask Up Michigan campaign to get the, some of the flyers and other information on why these face coverings are so critical and why we have to require these in our communities and really encourage everyone to make sure that they're masking up. And with that, I will stop presenting my screen and we will move to the question and answer period. Uh, I know I went really, really fast. As I mentioned, we're going to continue to do these types of Q&As on a host of topics, but certainly for gyms, fitness centers, bowling alleys, and those other businesses that just reopened, uh, we will be circling around to do these again. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Erica, and I'm going to be assisting Sean with the Q&A session here. If you haven't already submitted a question, you can do so now, and we'll get to as many as we can. There's a Q&A tab here in the live event. With that, Sean, I'm going to start with the first one. Do you have to wear a mask at all times when bowling? Yes. Yes, so uh, the requirement does not differentiate between a fitness center and a bowling alley. Now, I would uh, keep in mind that bowling alleys and certain other types of establishments like ice rinks are open for organized sports only. So this isn't just open bowl time. This is organized sports. All right. And does the 10 person limit on gatherings apply to gyms or fitness classes or do gyms only limit based on the 25 percent occupancy? Also, is it occupancy for the entire facility or are different workout rooms or studios treated as a separate space for the occupancy requirement? So that is a very long question. I might need you to repeat parts of it as I go, but I will do my best. So the 10 person limit will apply to classes. So if you are signing up for classes, that's going to be an organized event. 
And uh, that's, that's going to have that limitation under Executive Order 176. For just taking reservations or, you know, you pick your time to come in, it's not an organized event in there, you can come in and use workout stations or whatever, uh, that's going to fall under that 25% of your occupancy. But keep in mind, with the class or with the occupancy, you still need to be able to have people maintain that six feet of social distance, and they're going to need to be wearing masks at all times. All right. And does the face covering requirement mean that if a person is in the exercise facility alone, they still have to wear a face covering? Uh, yes, there's no distinction about the number of people in there. It's that they need to have that face covering on while they're exercising. The only exception is when people are swimming. And I just remembered, Erica, on the last question, the last part was what about a facility with different spaces? Uh, depending on how they're structured, if they are closed off areas, uh, you know, they're going to need to maintain that six feet of social distance. So if picture it this way, if you have two rooms in your gym, one's 10,000 square feet and one's 200, uh, it doesn't mean that you get to count the whole facility and you can have, you know, the 200 square foot room packed full of people. So you're going to need to look at it as individual spaces collectively maintain that six feet of social distance. All right, thanks for that clarification. Uh, will Myosha have an emphasis or outreach effort to gyms and fitness centers with both Myosha compliance and Myosha consultation groups? So it is fully our intent with the ambassador program to make sure that we are highlighting or, or focusing in on gyms and fitness centers in the coming days and weeks uh, to really make sure that we're hammering home these concepts and helping those businesses identify and, and get in and, and be in compliance if they're not already and give them the tools that they need on the enforcement piece. Uh, certainly we respond to complaints um, as required. So, uh, and we will certainly be out there enforcing uh, these requirements as well. All right, and previous orders stated that those that cannot medically tolerate a mask are exempt from wearing a mask. Does this still apply for recreation and fitness centers? The, there is no such exception within the executive order as it exists right now. There are some listed exceptions within Executive Order 176. I am not sure if that is one of those for fitness centers. Uh, we will clarify if necessary, but at this time our, our uh, read is that you're required to wear a face covering in a fitness center. All right. And is there a limit on the number of people allowed in specific rooms when social distancing, distancing cannot be achieved? Uh, in a gym or a fitness center or any of the, these that just reopened, uh, you're going to have to maintain that six feet of social distancing or and limit your class sizes to ensure that uh, uh, to to make sure. So that's not an option in the gym and fitness center that you cannot maintain six feet. You have to maintain six feet of social distance. OK, uh, the original order for regions six and eight did not require masks while exercising. Are they now required statewide? Yes, I am so glad I actually had that in my notes and I forgot to mention it. I think for those regions six and eight, it's important to note and point out that there is no distinction for region six and eight when it comes to these requirements for gyms, fitness centers and other locations. So yes, masks are now required to be worn while exercising in region six and eight as well, as well as any of those other requirements, including the 25% of your uh, occupancy. All right. And are face shields an acceptable replacement for masks? In certain workplaces, they may be, but uh, what, what's important here is the purpose of the face shield. Uh, in a fitness center, no, they are not an acceptable alternative, and that's because of, as I mentioned earlier, that when we're exercising and doing things, we're observing ourselves, we're putting out those large respiratory droplets and aerosols, not, not only more of them, but much harder so they're going to go further and a face shield is not going to stop that from escaping either under the bottom or out the back uh, and it's not going to protect those folks that are around you all right and if you are water walking in the pool do you have to wear a mask if you're water walking in the pool that is a very interesting question and i'm glad that they raised it so you can you do not have to wear a mask while you are swimming Pools indoors have to still limit to 25% uh, 
Uh, they have to make sure that on the pool deck itself, people that are not, not from the same household are six feet or more apart. Uh, if you are water walking, I would suggest that you're in the pool. You probably do not have to wear a mask. All right, while we're on the pool topic, we have another question here that is asking if uh, they can still teach swim lessons for kids. Uh, within that occupancy, yes. Okay, and if you have partitions up between equipment, do you still need to require the mask? Yes. All right, and this anonymous uh, guest is saying, I'm wondering what PPE should be worn for taking temperatures on entering guests. So if the entering guest has a face covering on and the person taking the temperature has a face covering on and it's a touchless thermometer, I would be shocked if you're using under the tongue ones, uh, but it's a touchless thermometer. You should be sufficient at that. I would probably recommend maybe gloves, but uh, overall you should be, as long as both folks are wearing their face coverings, you should be okay. Okay, and why are gyms not allowed to be open 24 hours? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. I'll have to, we'll have to put that one on the to be answered box. All right. You mentioned the 10 person limit per class, even though it may be in a large gym or a large space. Yes, yeah, so the organized event uh, requirements in 176 still apply to any location in Michigan, uh, including meetings and uh, uh, trainings and stuff in office settings, it's 10 people at the max uh, if you have an organized class where you bring in together people from a dis different household all working in that same space it's going to be 10 people all right and can a gym member file a complaint other than at the facility uh, for not following compliance absolutely they can contact both their local health department uh, and that would probably be their their best bet is to contact the local health department about the gym not being in compliance with the executive orders if it's related to workplace safety and those things, they can certainly call the hotline that I mentioned earlier and discuss that with my OSHA as well. All right, we have a question here from Ashley who says, I own a gymnastics facility with kids classes. Do the kids have to wear masks during class? So uh, the kid question is going to be in executive order 176 and it talks about certain age groups and we're gonna wanna look at and comply with those components for uh, the uh, executive order 175 with the requirements that we're discussing here i will have to clarify on the kids okay uh, and is there any data to support using hepa air filters with uv lights to kill or limit the virus in the air for gyms or office spaces there is data and it's uh, interesting and it's a good question. So we're gonna be talking a lot over the next couple of weeks, trying to put out good information about in indoor air and uh, the effects of COVID. If you go to our Michigan Labor and Economic Opportunity homepage, we have some best practice guidance there from ASHRAE, which is sort of the, uh, well, it's the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. Uh, I bet you nobody would have guessed that. And they have a COVID response uh, template there that they've gone through different types of workplaces and talked about what can happen. And one, one of the reasons with gyms and indoors we talk about so much is that we don't have that outdoor air necessarily to let this thing dissipate so rapidly. So in, in it could be getting sucked up and recirculated. If you're recirculating, uh, one of their recommendations is to shut that off. Open dampers to increase outdoor air, increase the amount of recirculation in your building, go to a MERV 13 or higher filter if your system will allow it. UV filters can help, but you're gonna wanna get definitely with an HVAC uh, either a company or an engineer to talk about like how many you need because it's all about airflow and all these different things. Uh, certainly HEPA, so a MERV 13 or higher, the, the micron size of the virus is believed to be about uh, 0.1 or something like that, I believe, and a MERV 13 or higher may be able to pull that out. HEPA kind of takes out everything, so they certainly help. You can get those standalone HEPA filters, which certainly help and also uh, impact your air changes per hour. So these are all things that are very, very important and critical, especially as we're all heading indoors uh, as it gets colder here in Michigan. So uh, we're gonna try to be continue to create new guidance and, and information around there. 
Perfect. Is that short answer? <laughs> yes, short and sweet. Uh, can fans be used for something like a spin class or should fans be avoided? So a spin class uh, is definitely going to be one of those 10 person ones and you're going to want to think about what you're doing with that fan. Uh, recognizing that people in the gym get hot and otherwise, but uh, if we look at other guidance on fans in different types of workplaces, one of the things we're concerned with is that you're blowing across people. So it kind of depends on where your fan is and how the ventilation works, uh, because you could literally be moving the virus that was contained from me to the person that is six feet away from me, but now you have a lot of force blowing right at that person. So I would suggest that uh, if you're going to use a fan, uh, really think about how you place that to try to ensure that you're not blowing across people. Uh, and that might be, you know, this row only has one rider, so the fan's at the front, and therefore it's not blowing. There's nobody behind me to capture that. So just be very mindful of how you're going to place it. All right. And can showers be opened and are masks required in that space? Showers can be open. I believe you could take the mask off while you're showering for sure. Uh, uh, locker rooms can be open, those types of things. You're going to want to be cleaning, sanitizing, all that kind of stuff pretty regularly in those spaces for sure. All right. And what about exercise rooms in hotels? Are we required to get our guests to sign in when they work out? Yes. If you're going to open that exercise room, you're going to want to, it's a fitness center, right? So you're going to want to follow, follow these guidelines just like, uh, you know, the, the big, fitness place down the street. All right, and why are regions six and eight having to wear a mask while doing yoga now when we haven't prior? So gyms and uh, fitness centers in particular are, you know, because of the that more exertion, all that kind of stuff, I recognize yoga, you, maybe that's not happening, uh, but for consistency of application and to ensure that our numbers do not continue to increase and while six and eight has remained more open than others uh, their numbers are continuing to trend high like the rest of the state so uh, for consistency and otherwise it's important that just wear the mask all right and what about jacuzzis and hotels can they be open no okay and what if an employee says they are unable to wear a mask? Do they need to provide medical documentation? And if they do, does the workplace have to allow them to work? Uh, that's going to fall under the ADA, and there's some great guidance on that. The employers, if an employee does, they're basically uh, requesting a reasonable accommodation. The employer should engage with them in a discussion on what they may need. That may include some documentation. Employers have to be cautious on what they're asking for uh, in that in that situation. I know that the Michigan Department of Civil Rights has some good information that you could check out on this to make sure you do that right. And if whatever accommodation they're requesting creates either more of a hazard for themselves or a hazard for their other employees, uh, maybe a leave or moving them to some other type of work might be the appropriate remedy. All right. And when weightlifting, a spotter is there for safety reasons, but will not maintain six feet of social distancing. Uh, this would also apply to personal trainers. Are these activities exempted? Uh, no, they're not exempted. And I would encourage you to do your best to maintain that distance to the max that you can. I am also a amateur weightlifter in my household, and I understand exactly what they're talking about. But uh, we're, you just, you're just going to want to really be careful, make sure you're wearing these face coverings, keep that social distancing. Obviously, we don't want people getting injured because they didn't have a spotter, but uh, they're not exempted from how this applies, and you're just going to have to manage that the best that you can. All right. Uh, and what about those who don't wear their mask properly, like they have their nose not covered? Uh, can gyms ask them to leave? Yes, absolutely. And uh, gyms should be reminding them they should have signs posted. Uh, we're talking about a few other creative tools that gyms might be able to use for this, recognizing that we do not want employee confrontations or managers or anybody else. We don't want uh, people getting hurt. Um, but uh, for gym patrons, if you're listening, uh, for gym owners, you got to wear the mask, you got to wear it correctly, and you should be reminding your patrons to pull it up. If it's not covering their nose, mouth, and chin, 
Uh, it's not doing what we're trying to do, and that's to keep our numbers down, keep these types of businesses open, and get open and stay open. All right, I, I have one last question I'm going to squeeze in here because it looks like uh, we have a few who are asking the same thing for different industries, and that is, are temperatures mandated to be taken for guests, whether it's a gym, a fitness center, um, or even a hotel? Uh, there are only a few spots where temperature screening is actually required, and it's primarily in workplaces that are in manufacturing, meat packaging, in casinos. Some or others are recommended. Uh, there's no obligation right now to temperature screen your guests coming in. I would encourage you to try it uh, uh, just to the best of your ability to do it if you can, um, but it's not an absolute requirement. All right, well, that's all the time we have for questions today. Is there anything else you want to leave us with, Sean? Absolutely. So this is another milestone for Michigan as we move forward in our fight against COVID, uh, certainly containing these numbers. I, I, there's no question that the governor, the DHHS and others are working hard to get businesses reopened in Michigan. Uh, we hear you. We know the hardship that you're sharing with us on being closed for this long. This is a small step forward. Uh, it's a big step as, as it relates to COVID, but I understand with the limitations, you know, it's kind of a small step forward in your business, but we have to really stick to these guidelines and stick together, wear the face coverings, make sure you're doing the social distancing, keep those class sizes down, help us keep these numbers down because the science and the numbers on the cases are really gonna drive what happens in Michigan. We've been doing a great job together fighting through uh, all the turmoil and angst and hardship that you've endured to get to this point. We cannot allow ourselves to get complacent, to fall backwards and let our numbers start spiking. And, you know, it's not just the bad actor down the street that's going to be impacted by an outbreak. It's going to be all of us. So we need that peer pressure. We need to support each other. We need you to push this message down and out to your communities and otherwise recognize that backyard barbecues have the same kind of risks as uh, any place that we're going to congregate together. And, you know, if we keep together, if we stick together, if we wear our face coverings, if we follow the social distancing, we practice good hygiene, we're going to keep our numbers down. And that is truly going to allow us to get open and stay open here in Michigan.